Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Trends in Technical Communication for 2011 and Beyond. My name is Sarah O'Keefe, and I've got my mystery guest, Nikki Blyle, with me as well. Thank you for coming, and let's get the show on the road. First thing you need to know is that you are all muted, except for the two of us. Nikki, are you there? I am here. Hi, Sarah. Hey, technology is working. Yay. OK, we have a questions area in the GoToWebinar interface. And I'm going to ask you to put your questions in there. We have an enormous number of people on this call. We had over 200 people register. And I don't know how many of you are actually going to turn up, but it's going to be a lot. We are recording the presentation. And in this particular presentation, I am also going to record the Q&A session. But the attendees will not appear in the recording. Uh, your names, your, you know, we have an attendee list, but you don't show up in the recording. So those are the things you need to know just generally. In addition to that, we are going to each talk to you about three trends that we see. We are probably going to argue and cross-talk and have a good old time. Uh, I would encourage you to put in your two cents via the questions area, and we will try to get to those discussions and those contributions as well. And we also have some polls that go along with all of these various trends that we're doing to kind of see what you think, whether you agree, disagree, um, think something else is completely more important, that type of thing. So with that, I would like to introduce Nikki. Many of you probably know her. She is a senior information developer at Component One. She's also a director of STC. And for those of you who have seen her speak in person, or perhaps on a webcast, a, an excellent speaker and very highly rated at numerous events. In addition to that, she can also write, which is always a plus for our industry. <laughs> and, and Nikki um, is going to start us off with trend number one. So Nikki, tell us about your first trend. OK, my first trend is Word, meaning Microsoft Word not just the word, is the new black. Nikki? Oh, Have I'm still here. You? I was just, wait I was just waiting. Here. I was just waiting for you to change the slide. I'm sorry. No, I did change the slide. Oh, I'm locked. OK. Wonderful. Oh. OK, we will, I will tap dance while you fix the technology. <laughs> Wish me luck. Maybe. OK, you Maybe tap dance. I will not. Tell us about why Word is the new black. OK, I will do that while we're doing that. OK, it is a cool slide, though, so that works. OK, first of all, uh, Word has always been part of the technical communicator's toolkit, but now more people are embracing it. And by embracing it, I mean two different things. First of all, more people are admitting they actually use it in their day-to-day -day work. I know everyone uses Word for, for different things. I mean doing your tech comm projects. And also, more people are switching back to it. They may have gone to other things, but they're, they're coming back to it. Um, one reason is, is the agile software development movement, but there are others. And because it, you know, it fits very well in agile projects, um, it's obviously used widely in software and non-software documentation. So that's another thing to talk about. I'm a software doc person, but I know not everybody is. And I know that a lot of you out there who don't do software documentation but are still in the technical communication space are, are using it for all your projects. And also, Word plays well with SharePoint. So uh, SharePoint's gaining a lot of, uh, I mean, it's always had a lot of popularity. But now with SharePoint 2010, 10, we're seeing even more. So uh, that is another plus to uh, using Microsoft Word. OK. Um, you will not be surprised to hear that I kind of disagree. Or <laughs> I am not our surprised. Customer. Um, <clears throat> the particular people that we see that show up on our doorstep and ask us for help um, are not particularly interested in pursuing Word. That said, we recognize, of course, that the people that show up on our doorstep and ask for help with XML are not necessarily a representative sample of the industry. So I think it's probably important for us to recognize that what we see is this sort of pinhole view of the world and not necessarily the actual view. So uh, did your slide come back? Uh, no. I'm, I'm oh. looking at the bow tie guy. 
But um, I mean, I realize there's been, you know, I mean, we're, you know, Word is very feature rich and has, you know, has a lot going for it. In, as I said, integrates with a lot of other tools. And I know, I mean, your space is is the space you talked about, and there's a lot of discussion about data in XML. But th those solutions need a very specific set of problems. So uh, I, I I think that I see a lot of people that are using Word, which is why I know I'm being kind of toolsy here, but. Well, I think that's that is that I is that, that is what I'm seeing, and All I'm right. very. It's very interesting that yeah. And by the way, the slides are good, but it's very interesting to see um, see people going back to it. They've been there, and now they're bouncing back. So, okay, so yes, let's that's... take a look at this. Um, I have a poll for this, and I'm going to launch it, and we will see if that actually works. So, <clears throat> um, take a look at the poll and see what you think. Uh, from the attendees, and we'll let you guys go through and kind of vote on this. Um, there is a comment from interesting. Uh, there's one comment that says that I'm not sure I agree that Word fits well with Agile. Um, what do you think about that, Nikki? Oh, I I think it fits very well, and the issue is, I mean, there's a lot of you know tools and things around the whole Agile process, but one of the things that is an issue is letting everyone contribute in an easy way. And Word is something everybody's going to have on their machine and everybody understands in your, in your, in your Agile team. So you could, you know, so it's very usable. It, fit, it fits for, I know a lot of people who are actually doing it. I agree that there's probably a lot of people who are not using it in their Agile process, but I know a lot of people who are. All right, so let's take uh, a look I here. I'm going to close this poll okay. so we can see the results. And um, it looks as though there are <laughs> Not too many people that are totally on board. Um, given sort of our target audience, that's probably not that surprising. You've got a biased audience here. Um, there are also some other comments coming in. Um, so, you know, one saying that basically no way because no tech writer would actually agree to use Word. Um, that I, yeah, I see that when it says it says you can you know you cannot be a serious tech writer if you use Word, and I I find that a very odd statement because well yeah well, I mean there are a ton of people that use Word a ton, and I think it's easy to forget when you're in a different camp like if you're a for example FrameMaker fan. or if you're in an XML world, it's really really easy to forget that there are a lot of people out there that are using Word. I mean, a ton, and for tech writing. So I would... Yes, and I will note at the end of the day that the end users, I mean, when you create a, a manual or a help system, and whether you authored in Word or whether you authored in any other tool, your, um, you know, actually wrote the, the words in that tool, your end user doesn't know what you used. So... How, how does this take away our seriousness? That, that's or or our uh, professionalism. That's that would and be my I, point on that. Yeah, it's actually a very interesting question, and I have some. Um, I actually have a different trend that that ties into this, which we will get to later. So, um, although I'm you know not wild about the idea of word, I think that there are definitely cases where that that's the way to go. I can't believe I just said that. Um, and we can talk about when that might be. Let me get through a couple of these other questions and we'll move on to the next one. There's a vote for wikis rather than Word. Um, there's one person asking about the use of Word in reaching out to departments that don't use our niche tools to solicit collaboration. Uh, I think that's a really good point, that Word does yeah, potentially open that up, right? Absolutely. Um, okay, did an XML, I'll come back to that one. Um, a comment about Word not playing well with longer documents. Oh, another one comment about Word not playing well with longer documents. <laughs> I see that. I haven't, in the latest versions, like 2007 and 2010, I haven't seen a problem with that. But, you know, your mileage may vary, but I have seen, um, I have seen I much improvement in that. Um, I see another comment that says composing a complex document is, is a nightmare. 
Um, but a more interesting, or sorry, more, not more interesting, but two others that are in a different vein. Um, one person here says, you use what your client wants you to use. I'm freelancing and I dislike Word, but I work in it all the time. And that is actually the point that I'm going to be making later, is that if you have a business requirement to use it, then you're going to use it. Another one here, uh, <laughs> much as I despise it, she starts, I'll probably need to go back to Word because my output is shifting away from PDF, miserable rotten product. I've been framed since 2.1. So uh, the professional uses the right tool at the right time. Word is the right tool for some doc project. Um, yeah, that's some other ones, lots and lots of comments. Um, we will make some of these comments available. Uh, there's some people asking about that, but we can't give you comments with people's names attached to them for, for a variety of reasons, mostly having to do that we pro with the fact that we promised not to. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you everybody. Great comments. I'm going to hide the poll results and uh, move on. This is my uh, obligatory bio slide. There it is. There's a lovely picture. I'm wearing makeup. It's exciting. <laughs> okay, moving right along. And pearls. Um, and pearls. I wear those a lot more often than I wear the makeup. Okay. The trend that I want to talk about is accountability, which actually ties in very nicely to, believe it or not, to what you were just saying. Um, if you are in TechCom, you need to prove your business value. And what I mean by that is that technical communication in general needs to be able to show that it is providing value. And so some of these comments along the lines of, you know, you will pry FrameMaker out of my cold, dead hands, well, if that's not the right tool for your organization, then they are going to pry it out of your hands, um, and that's just how it's going to be. So I expect to see a lot more focus on metrics and analytics. In particular, it's relatively easy to take web analytics. If I'm delivering HTML content on a website, it is pretty easy to put a web analytics layer on top of that and then do things like measure what topics get hit the most. Um, what topics get the most comments, assuming I have a commenting layer? What topics get the most upvotes or downvotes? Or you could have a little star system and stuff like that. So there are a lot of things you can do with metrics, with web analytics, to measure the most effective content. The next thing that's going to happen is that the manager is going to look at this and say, OK, so Nikki has 500 topics in the help system, or in the help, and Sarah has 500 topics. And I noticed that Nikki's average star rating is like a four and a half, and Sarah's average star rating is a two. So, hmm, what do you do with that? Um, so all of a sudden, I think, as writers, as content creators, we're going to be, um, I don't want to use the word exposed, but our effectiveness is going to be measurable. A similar or related point to that is that your software and systems for tech com creation have to show return on investment and not just ooh shiny. So just because you think that something is fun and cool, whether it's a wiki or XML or DITA or the latest help viewer or anything else, um, shiny is sort of irrelevant unless you can show that it affects your business. You have to show how these things affect return on investment, affect your business operations. And the corollary to this is that if, if you are in a situation of basic tech comm, of doing just slam some topics out the door without too much thought about their effectiveness, I expect that to be commoditized, which means it goes to the lowest bidder, which probably means it will get outsourced or even crowdsourced, that people will say, well, we'll just, we'll just have the community do that. Um, so I expect a very, very strong focus on business value in the context of technical communication. So what do you think, Nikki? Oh, I, 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 th I think this is true. I think it's, it's always been true to a, a certain extent. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's always, a, I mean, we're an important part of of, of a product, so we have to prove our business value. I, I do think that sometimes we do get caught up a little too much in the ooh shiny. Um, as I said, sometimes at the end of the day, you may have spent untold hours 
uh, putting together a specific, uh, doing the technology behind a system, say setting everything up in data. I'm not saying that's bad. That's just my example. And then, you know, at the end of the day, the end users don't know how much that that time doesn't show in your output. And if you, if, but if you have the resources to do it and do it right, you know, go for it. But if that time is better spent writing and providing more content, then you know, go for it. Um, that's what you should be doing. And and about about crowdsourcing, I don't, I'm wondering what you mean by basic tech comp because I mean there are a lot of things that we document. We document you know you know nuclear reactors and you know um, met different medical systems and things. These could never be crowdsourced. So there there is a there is a lot of material out there that is still needs to be done by a professional. So do you, do you, what do you I do not you recommend that we I do not recommend that we crowdsource nuclear reactor documentation. Oh. Good to hear. Uh, yeah. Uh, although I would say that if the if the crowd in question was the nuclear engineers inside that reactor, you might very well want to spend some time getting information from them and giving them a way to contribute. But that's not what I'm talking about here. Right. What uh, that's sort of like know, collab yeah, internal no. collaboration. Right. What I'm talking about here is that the uh, sort of consumer level, entry level content simple. I expect that that content, that organizations see that, okay, we have to do this, but we don't see a lot of value in doing it really well. It's a checkoff. And that that's what's going to get commoditized, outsourced, or otherwise sort of gone, goes to the lowest bidder. That's, that's my thought, is that the stuff that doesn't add a ton of value is vulnerable to going away as a professional assignment. Okay. So, but not the nukes. Please not the nukes. Um, <laughs> so a couple of comments on this. Uh, let's see, somebody taught, and I, I flung a couple of them back through the questions. You may be able to see them. Uh, improving quality of writing of the population. We have a lot of people from other countries embedded with us. I think this means measuring improvement in their writing, but I'm, I'm not totally sure. Um, there are two people asking for resources on this, uh, products, approaches, books, that kind of thing. Uh, I will try and get some of those out via the follow-up messages that we'll send out. I don't have anything off the top of my head. Um, Nikki, do you have anything off the top of your head here? On, on, on uh, gathering metrics. Um, John, John Hedke writes quite a bit about that, and I think he has um, information on his blog, and I'm trying to remember the URL of his blog. Yeah, he's got it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he also has, yeah, if you just go to headkey.com, which is H-E-D-T-K-E, um, it will lead you to his other writings. But he does quite a bit on measuring, uh, doing analytics. So a couple of comments here. My department is staffed at 25%, so I need crowdsourcing to help with the backlog. I'll happily curate. Um, well, see, there's an interesting thing about that too. I think. Sorry to interrupt, Sarah, but it, it's ahead. there are for software products that that okay. And once again, I'm being in my software space. Uh, for software products that that customers are paying for, I, I really don't see I, I see a lot of you know, desire on, on customers' parts to write your documentation for you. I mean, people are glad to, like, tweet tips and, you know, send you emails and, and generally jump in with little little bits and pieces. But I don't think you're going to get fully, I mean, I haven't seen this, that getting fully formed topics. When people crowdsource uh, open source products and, they, well, I guess, the, anyway, open source projects and things, they are contributing to a community they are, they're part of that. There's a whole different set of motivations for doing that sort of work, where you might write a lot more stuff for free. So I kind of you know, don't really see that you're going to have tons and tons of customers that want to sit down and, and write the kind of detail that is needed to document a software product. All right, let's see what people think. I'm going to launch the poll. Um, oh, and yeah, here's an interesting point from... Julio, until official, in quotes, 
Until official documentation proves more accurate and usable than crowdsourced information, the trust in that information is actually lower than crowdsourced info. Uh, I have seen that, that research that says that the trust level of a user forum is actually higher than reading what's in the help, basically. And that is kind of upsetting. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. So, okay, let's get these votes in and move on because, of course, we're massively behind already, which is completely my fault <laughs> as moderator. So, a uh, question about content reuse while you're voting. How do you measure metrics for content reuse? Um, I will get that into the the answers that come back, but the, the short answer is if you have a content management system, you can do it because that's one of the things they will do, some of them better than others. All right, uh, I've got about 80% that have voted, so let's take a look here and see what we've got. Um, yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty strong in that direction. Um, looks like some of you think not yet, but maybe soon, one of these days. All right, let's move on. Nikki has trend number three. Okay, with this handsome tiger here, SharePoint as content management system. Now, um, I know I'm being kind of tool focused today. I will get off that for my next trend. But um, And as you've seen, I, I love arguing uh, technical communication theory. So I think I could be a little tool focused today. In any case, uh, many companies are already have SharePoint and are using it enterprise-wide. Um, the new version, which is SharePoint 2010, is, is much easier to use than the earlier version and it's very feature rich. And by that I mean you can you know, tag files very easily with metadata. You, there are features for versioning, workflow, permissions. There's a translation management feature. Um, and you know that 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 is that, that is the nutshell of my trend. And it and it can be used uh, it, since SharePoint can be used as a content management system. I've seen people doing it, and I think we're going to see more of it. I think we're going to see more of it. Um, what what I'm actually seeing is a really interesting kind of hybrid approach where our customers are putting their component content management into something else, but using SharePoint for workflow, which I think is kind of fascinating. Um, because they, they don't want to go through the work of getting SharePoint to understand, you know, components and reuse and those kinds of things. Right. No, it's, so. it's I mean, you, you, yeah, and I mean, and people could embrace it at different levels, obviously, and I'll say, you know, this is, sort of been my, my feel. I've been doing a lot of uh, talks about SharePoint lately and everything, so I will say that this is kind of my filter that I'm seeing uh, not only a lot of interest when I go out and talk to people, you know, when you poll the room and say how many people are using it and using some of these, you know, one or all of these features, almost many people in the room, their hands go up, a lot of people, so I find that really interesting. Well, let's take a look here, speaking of um, that, and see what people say in response to that. How many of you are using SharePoint? Um, and there are a couple of comments here. Uh, the question falls to how many resources you have to, to set it up. Um, some issues with multiple portals and having to hop around to find stuff. Um, I love its ease of use and flexibility, but not designed as a content management system for large pubs departments. It's okay for smaller groups, says one person. Hmm. And it looks as though, um, I'll give you a few more seconds to finish up on the poll, but it looks as though this is, yeah, I, th I think you might win on this one. <laughs> isn't, isn't finding things sort of the, it's like the, the I don't, I was going to say the goose that laid the golden egg. I think that's the wrong the Holy Grail. Here. But it's just it's just findability across the board of everything on Earth is is a big issue right now. It's I, I I mean we wade through tweets and blog posts and all these things and 
people wade through health systems, and findability is what we, at the end of the day, I think what we're always talking about for everything. So let's, let's close this poll and take a look at the results, which I think tend to, yeah, I mean, 30% of the people on this call are telling you that they're using SharePoint. And, and probably that other six that say I totally agree. So at least a third of the people that are here. Uh, looks like you've got some holdouts on the other end. Uh, That's OK. Interesting breakdown. Uh, we use it, but we won't use it for documentation. Um, I would not manage source files, but I manage PDF reviews, or I would manage PDF reviews. That's kind of the hybrid workflow I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Another one says we're getting SharePoint. Not sure if we can use it for stock. Um, Perforce, which is a source control system for content management and SharePoint for sharing, but not for the final version. Great for performing shared reviews. Um, you know, comment about how it doesn't do components. Um, oh, and an interesting one here. SharePoint exemplifies the innovator's di dilemma. They are nibbling at the low end, but they can nibble their way all the way up. <laughs> So, ah, and, maybe that's, and, maybe and I'll that. give the final word to this last question, which says, uh, we're not holdouts, we're smart. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Um, the fourth trend that I have is, um, and I've written about this, is the question of a schism in technical communication. And I kind of touched on this with the business value slide. Um, I think that we're going to start to see a real split, and I mean a big split, between what I would describe as traditional technical writing of doing just help and books and sort of throwing them over the transom. And you know, we know that it shouldn't be that way. And probably for those of you that are on this call, because you are in fact doing some research and learning and this and that, that's probably not you. But there are an awful lot of people embedded in an awful lot of policy and procedure IT groups in financial bank type places. I mean, there are a lot of people out there that are doing what I would describe as traditional or maybe low-end technical writing. The other group is doing uh, some of the stuff I have listed here, but more strategic work, thinking about collaboration, thinking about uh, adding you know, crowdsourcing at an appropriate place thinking about business relevance and all of these things. And what I think is going to happen, uh, what I think is already happening, is that the non-strategic group, and, and I'm not saying you have to go to XML either. Let me be very clear about that. I just sort of made a list of some of the stuff you need to think about if you're the, quote, modern one, unquote. I think that that more strategic group is going to increase in value and relevance and employment and all that other good stuff. And I think that this sort of traditional group is going to be in trouble coming down the pipe because people are just not willing to pay for that anymore or not willing to pay for it at the level that we would like to see. So the just, I just write, I don't do anything else, I just write is, is a marginal kind of thing. But the people who can plan and deliver information products that are perceived as relevant and valuable to the business, that's where the career growth and the career success is going to be. And I'll be interested to see how many people beat me up for this one. What do you think, Nikki? Well, I think we, I mean, there are all kinds of projects. And there are all kinds of people doing those projects. And I think they're all, it's all good, basically. And, and, and it's kind of like what we were talking about with tools. You know, some, some projects need, you know, they, they need lots of layers. They, they have translation. You're using doing resources. There's a lot of layers of complexity, and some projects are not like that. So you do the right thing for the right project. I think, you know, the same thing goes on here. There are some jobs, and there are some projects that need, um, that need strategy, that need you to add, um, you know, videos to your projects and, you know, do all sorts of other things like that. And there are some projects that are just kind of, you know, quick and dirty and, and can, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. They don't require a lot of strategy. It's like materials need to be updated and, you know, we need something new for this. So I, I think that this is just sort of the nature of, of any business, that you have some projects that, 
have have big have larger requirements than others. So, so I don't know if I character I don't in. know if I characterize yeah. it as a schism. I, my fear is that what's going to happen is that people are not going to be able to jump from one to the other. That they're going to get um, boxed in. Um, so a couple of questions or comments coming in. Should tech writers relabel ourselves as business analysts? Maybe. Not the worst idea I've ever heard. Um, let's see. Um, and, and yeah, related comment to that. I've met several traditional technical communicators who have learned a trade and are unwilling to have to relearn it to move over to the modern tech comms. Some of them are not finding work. That's what, that's what I'm expecting to see. Um, well, you so know what I'm, I'm sorry, you know what I've seen that's now. that's funny too is that there were some people for a while where the, the company had a group where there were a bunch of writers, but there was one person who knew how to use uh, the help authoring tool and did all of the you know they didn't do any of the writing they did all of the you know machinations and getting it into the system and making the outputs and. And sometimes that, uh, and I've heard that people like that are sometimes losing their jobs because they, they only did that part of the job and uh, what could have, you know, what you could do then at a company is you could tell all of the writers, well, you know what, you, you need to embrace this technology and use it and, and create the output yourself. So it kind of has two sides because you could be a person who's more of the, the wizard. Yeah, and a comment here. I, I can't get to all of these comments because there are a ton of them, but thank you to all of you. Uh, it goes back to analyzing value if the powers that be see more value in the modern stuff than the traditional stuff. Um, another commenter saying, um, oh, this is interesting. Our company has content strategy, screencasting, XML, content management, and even online help divided up across several departments. Frustrating because I'm pigeonholed into books. And the other departments hold on to their tech comm with an iron fist. I would love to branch out. Uh, maybe time to look for a new job. <laughs> um, that was in her comments. So that was not me. Uh, so yes, lots and lots of interesting comments here. I will try to pull these together into something that's a little more um, anonymous. So <laughs> but there's some really great comments coming in on this. Um, okay, one comment here from somebody who I happen to know is a freelancer. Uh, so far, very, very few RFPs coming my way for modern, many more for traditional. I'm interested in modern, but I can't make money with it. So that's, you know, that's completely legitimate, obviously. So, and another one who says, we are restricted by our clients who really resist and want their PDF and nothing more. So, very interesting. Okay, let's take a look at this on a... Uh, poll and see what you come up with. No, we seem to have pretty widespread agreement on this one. It is definitely an issue. Um, one comment, one comment from somebody brave who says, "I guess I'm part of the traditional group. I'm a lone writer. I try to learn lots of things on my own." <clears throat> but my company doesn't let me experiment that much. And that is the thing, you know, I worry about that because if you're stuck in an organization that pigeonholes you into, as somebody else said, into the place you don't really want to be and you can't get out of that, well, if you stay there 10 years, then what happens? I, I agree. And I was reading this week, I know you need to bring the poll up, Sarah, but I was reading oh. a lot this week about something I hadn't heard of before. And I'll be honest, it's called the Software Craftsmanship Movement. And this is a, a sort of a software developer thing. And one of their tenets is, I mean, I won't explain it all now, but one of their tenets is confront your ignorance. And what they, what they mean by that is make a list of things you don't know and then find a way to learn them. And I thought that it was very nice that they sort of, you know, quantify that and spell that out. That even if it's not something you're doing in your job right now, just take the time and try to learn it on your own and then apply it somehow. Maybe you won't apply it today, but you'll apply it in a few years. But I thought that was a neat way of putting it, confront your ignorance. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what we've got here. I'm going to close this poll. There's at least one commenter that said these, these categories don't really work for her. Um, th this is, of course, 
if you haven't noticed already, an extraordinarily unscientific poll. So don't take it <laughs> too uh, don't take it too seriously. Uh, okay, so yeah, it looks like everybody's kind of on board with this one um, to a certain extent. Um, that there is some stuff going on here, and and we've got we've got some issues to work through. All right, Nikki, what have you got for us? Oh, okay, this is my last trend of the day, I guess, and it's try paying help is here to stay. And I'm not talking specifically about chums because try paying help can be web-based outputs and uh, other other browser-based output. So this happens to be a screen, oh, that screen capture really quickly was Exhibit oh, A. Uh, that's all right. It was the Microsoft Help Viewer. Um, that was a, a, a small screen cap of the brand new version that was just uh, released with Visual Studio 2010. Um, one thing that, you know, a lot of you may not be keeping up with Microsoft Help Viewer because it's an output that's only integrated with Visual Studio 2010. But I think the progress of the Microsoft Help Viewer output is interesting because um, the first version included, I mean, well, if we step back, if any of you remember Assistance Platform Help, uh, that took away the table of contents in the help system or it hit it by default and it took away the index, there was only search, and people don't like it. Technical communicators don't even sometimes care for that. And Microsoft Help Viewer, the first version, had a non-traditional index, not our standard tree view, and, sorry, a table of contents. Sorry, I misspoke there. Uh, it it, it, it uh, had a non-traditional table of contents, and it had no index. And software developers who use the system did not like that. They wanted there to be a, they said, we want the index back, and this table of contents isn't working for us. And so with this, the second version of the Microsoft Help Viewer that was released, this was rectified. So this is what um, you're seeing the index view right now. But you can see this is try paying help. It's a little bit different than what we're used to, but it's still, at the end of the day, um, try paying help, although I think that term even confuses people because it, it really is two pains. I mean, we kind of count the, the button bars as, as a pain. Um, so in any case, that's, that's exhibit A that I think try paying help is here to stay because it's standing the test of time. Um, for, uh, there, ha uh, there are some issues with web-based outputs that when you have try paying help, there's, there are issues with, with the scripting that is used to make try paying help. So uh, your end users, uh, if they uh, install the, uh, a web-based help output locally, they will first get that yellow ActiveX scripting uh, message, and it says, is it OK to show this? And then, then they can turn that on. And sometimes users won't do that. They'll just say, maybe I won't accept this. But now there, there, are, it, there is a workaround um, by using the mark of the web. Uh, so if you do that, then you won't have those problems. So there's a workaround to that. Um, and then the other thing is that um, it's kind of interesting that the tri -pane window takes a lot of criticism for sort of being old-fashioned. But it's really what, what, what is wrong with this navigation that people like? We give them a lot of options. They could use the table of contents. They could use the index. They could use the search. It, it covers the gamut of the different ways that people like to find things. And the most important thing in a help system is that people find things. And our, our TOC is, is more or less, I mean, websites have navigation. They have ways that you find different categories of information on the website. So, you know, why, I, I don't know, I kind of feel like sometimes people are being haters on something that is, you know, that this is the paradigm that is appropriate for help, and websites use the paradigm that is appropriate for them, uh, but, you know, there, there's this kind of feeling that ours comes up short compared to what websites deliver, and I just don't see why, because I think that, try, as I said, try paying help is, stood the test of time and I think I think at the end of the day people like it and it's a good it's a good way for people to find things in health systems. 
Okay, so a couple of comments on that coming from the audience. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll while we talk about some of these questions. Um, try can help us find for more complex UIs, but what about embedded user assistance for things like Flex apps and iPad apps? What's, what's your take on that? Um. I'm sorry, that one went by too fast for me, Sarah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you spoke too um, quickly. Well, this, this, the question is basically, what if you have a Flex application or an iPad app, essentially something that doesn't, where you couldn't necessarily run a browser side by side with it because it might take uh, over the screen? Yeah, that sort of mobile. Uh, I mean, the mobile projects are, are going to be completely different. I, I guess I should have qualified what I was saying by saying. Um, you know, when you're when you're at a at a desktop, it doesn't have to be a desktop application, but mm -hmm. when you have okay. the space. So I hope. Sorry, um, I didn't make that clearer. A uh, comment here that local tripane help does not work in Chrome. Hmm. I I I have not seen that, and I and I test on uh, on that so. I, I can't really comment on that. Maybe certain systems don't, or I'd, I'd have to know more specifics. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, a couple of people basically agreeing with you that, that TriPane is, is the way to go. And then there's one talking about the fact that TriPane uh, traditionally has overlooked the needs of those requiring true accessibility and screen readers that needs to evolve. To you know, to address the accessibility issues. Yes, I think I think that there there could be improvements. And but the, but the, at the end of the day, yeah, we're saying we need that. Those are the kind of improvements we need under the hood. And I think they they should be made. But um, but so, I don't. And, um, you know, that would be seen by the group that it, it would. It, yes, we should have things work for people who need it to work. Okay, so let's close this poll and see what people think. And yeah, it looks like most every, not most everybody, but certainly a majority is on board with either it's definitely sticking around or there's really no other way to go at this point. But you've got a good good number of people that are not not sure at this point. So all right, let's take a look at the last one and then we will take some questions and encourage you also, those of you that are on the call, to uh, send in your own trends, the, the ones that we're missing, because I'm going to pop in the last one here, and then you can tell us all the things that we should have talked about. So the last one that I want to talk about is the cloud and cloud computing and cloud-based technical communication development, not delivery. That's a whole other can of worms. So if you're in the cloud, and what I'm referring to here is web-based authoring tools for technical writers or web-based content delivery tools, content management systems for technical writers. There are a few of them out there, not a ton, but there are a few. Uh, a wiki is actually a sort of special purpose form of this in that you do all your authoring in a web browser. You don't download it. You don't really have a desktop install. So what I'm talking about when I say cloud-based technical communication is the idea that we are going to have tools that allow us to do technical communication work that are not desktop based. They are probably web browser based. That's what I'm talking about here. The advantages of this have to do with software configuration and backup. Uh, we do a lot of implementation work and one of our big challenges is making sure that each and every technical writer in a particular organization has all the right configuration of all the right stuff the correct version of the help authoring tool, the correct version of the, you know, the XML authoring tool, the correct version of the Ditto Open Toolkit to generate all their stuff. And managing that desktop by desktop is pretty annoying. And managing it in on a server, an internal server, is potentially interesting. But having somebody else manage it for you is really, really nice, especially for a smaller group. If you have a group of three to five writers, then the idea that somebody has uh, a Google Docs that does XML for you is, is really pretty handy. Uh, and there are two other things here that I think are important. 
Um, it eliminates the requirement that when you are working, you have to be on a specific machine. Now, with laptops, you can take your laptop home with you and you can do stuff. But at least in theory, with the cloud, you could sign on to any computer and do your work. Now, public internet cafe, maybe not the best idea in the world, but it does give you some additional flexibility. Now, on the, the downside, I have this on under advantages, but I don't know that it is. The hosting requirement can be an issue. A lot of companies don't want to host their content. They want their content inside their firewall on their personal servers. So that is an issue. But the cost advantage of moving to the cloud is absolutely compelling for most organizations, most, certainly most smaller organizations. Bigger organizations, it gets a little weird. But if you have fewer than, say, 20 writers, then moving to the cloud is probably going to be compelling for you from a cost point of view. And we hear a lot of discussion about security, which I think is a legitimate concern. But you know, you can lose your laptop in a bar. You can, you can do all sorts of silly things. You can lose a flash drive that has a lot of stuff on it. So I think it's just a different kind of security issue. I'm not sure it's a worse security issue or a better security issue. But I think this is going to be important coming down the road. Maybe not this year, but within the next few years. Um, Nikki, what do you think? I, I don't know. I'm going to give you an I don't know on this one. You do hear a lot of, uh, Microsoft is running a lot of ads about the cloud. So I'm, I'm curious to see how this all plays out. I mean, it, it, it has its advantages for some things. And as you said, it, it has disadvantages. So. Um, I, I think this is going to take a while for this particular uh, this particular item to play out, but I think that it's obviously something that is being talked about, and a lot of people are, uh, you know, there's all sorts of hybrid solutions, and there are solutions coming out for different things. So I'm I'm curious to see how it plays out. Yeah, me too. Um, so let's take a look and see what you guys think about this one. And uh, a couple of comments coming in here. Uh, <coughs> one says, if Google decides to get into TechCom support, all bets are off. Cloud-based will become the norm. I, I don't know that that's going to happen. But there are two or three tools out there right now that, w that actually that do what I'm interested in, which is um, the issue of DITA in the cloud. There are actually a, you know, a number of tools that do that as this point, at this point. They're kind of early on, but, but there they are. So another comment yeah, someone, here. Yeah, mm -hmm. someone mentioned something about the, you know, you, you need internet access, which is, and you need, you know, good internet access. And it's interesting, we are kind of, um, uh, we do kind of just assume that everyone has access like, uh, like that, and not everyone does. So that will continue to be an issue. Yeah. So a couple of comments here. Uh, my former manager does this well. He's created a tech writing platform using Joomla. Um, there's a comment here, a question about, oh, how can I answer clients who worry about the security of cloud-based systems, not just hackers, industrial espionage, but the risk that a specific cloud app will disappear? Um, that can happen. I, I don't think it's terribly likely, but it, it could obviously happen, especially if they don't pay their bills. So I suppose that answer A is that you have to make sure that there's a good backup strategy, maybe some sort of an escrowing approach. Um, but you know, there is also I the mean, risk look, that look. your server goes down. The same problem, essentially. So what were you going to say? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to pop in with Google Wave. There were people who were collaborating on projects on Google Wave, and Google uh, shut it down. Yeah, so although they did give us warning. They didn't actually kill it dead and you know not give people access to their content or anything like that. They did, and I think they were also providing a way for you to extract your con content and get, and get it. They're, they're, good, they're good that way. But, um, you know, yeah, things, things like that can, can come and go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, all right, let's close this poll and take a look and see what we get here. Uh, yeah, lots of people worried about security, and I don't blame you um, one little bit. 
down with the cloud. Down with the cloud. Only 4% said down with the cloud. So uh, let's see, a couple of comments here. Somebody doing some research on this. Um, names, URLs of the tools for data in the cloud. Uh, there are three of them, and I'll put them in the question and send them back out, but they are Xopus, X-O-P-U-S, DocZone, and EasyData, E-A-S-Y-D-I-T-A. And DocZone is D-O-C, Zone, Doc Place, Doc Zone. Do I have any thoughts about EasyData <laughs> comes in? Um, I, I've seen a demo. It looks interesting. That's kind of as far as I've gotten with it. There's another comment here about SkyTap VMs, probably virtual machines. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about that, so I will just point out that somebody has mentioned SkyTap. Uh, Cloud-based tech, would that be a good option for a company that has only one tech writer? I think it would be the best option if there's only one tech writer because, well, no, I take it back. If there's only one of you, the issue of desktop maintenance is less of an issue. You can just install whatever you need on your machine and not worry about consistency with other people. Um, that said, cloud-based would also lower your overhead and do what you need to do there. So I think it would be a good option and it would be something to consider. Um, so a couple other comments about things that they've seen. Uh, strange to hear that some users don't have internet access. Well, yes, but I, I will point out that I've started moving a lot of stuff to the cloud. I use Flickr for a lot of the images that I have in here. Uh, I'm using Google Docs heavily for sort of internal documents, not tech comm projects, but just stuff we need to keep track of internally. And, you know, there I was on an airplane, and I had problems because I couldn't get to half the stuff I needed because that particular airplane did not have Wi-Fi. So it, it's really an issue um, that if one, when you're cut off, you're suddenly cut off, and it's pretty ugly. So, um, and then we and then we back the same things up to our machines, and then we can't find them, and that findability just right. rears its ugly head again. <laughs> uh, there's a question here about PCI certification. I don't know anything about that, unfortunately. Maybe somebody else does who's on the thing. Um, servers go down all the time. Our internally hosted server in Europe has been unavailable for two weeks. Says somebody. Uh, Cloud-based file sharing and sync tools, which enable you to work offline and sync when you're back online. And I know, uh, coming from that particular person, there's one called Nomadesk, um, which is a file sharing thing. So, all right, let's hide the results of this. And what I want to do is, um, I still, wow, you people are entertaining and discussing things this this time around. So here's what I want to do. Um, I decided against doing a direct face-off of our trends because uh, Nikki and I would like to continue liking each other. But what I did do is I made a poll, which is the question of which of these three that Nikki gave you are the most important. Um, our next slide is going to be your turn to talk about trends that you see that perhaps we have not addressed. And we've got a few minutes to deal with those. So if you have some of those that you want to talk about, Throw them on out there. And I'll give you a few seconds to deal with this one, and let me go back and see what else we have here. Uh, how do I view content delivered on mobile devices for the future? Uh, that sounds like a trend encapsulated in a question. Um, I think it's going to be important. Uh, that's kind of duh. Um, many, many years ago, I was at a conference, and somebody made the, the their t prediction, their trend was that mobile devices would get smaller and more powerful. <laughs> and I remember um, that. He was mocked. He was mocked unmercifully for that. And I kind of feel it like that this kind of falls in that category. I'm not going to mock you. But that content delivered on mobile devices is important and getting more important because of the heavy use of the mobile devices. What do you think, Nikki? Oh, I, I mean, yeah, it's time has come. We basically, people have been talking about the, in our space, in our, like, you know, at our conferences and things for, for, I think, 10 years on this, if I'm not mistaken, Sarah. And they've said it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Well, it's here. <laughs> so uh, the buildup was was uh, big, but, you, you know, the, the ubiquitousness of um, mobile devices means now, yes, people are starting to care that there is help and, Absolutely. But it's the 
the ramp up has been a long, a long time coming. I've enjoyed it. So here is the poll result for you. And <laughs> that's kind of interesting. So we have basically an, a pretty even split between SharePoint and TriPane. Not so much on the word. That's, that's okay. pretty entertaining. Any comments on that? For me, no, that's, uh -huh. that seems fair. Everyone's <laughs> entitled to their own opinion. <laughs> all right, let's take a look at the other one. These are my trends. Uh, I notice that mine are all kind of grim. I know, I'm curier than you are. That's right. Uh, let's see, a couple of comments here. I use ePublisher to deliver content for iPad. Uh, Evernote help you between mobile home and work computing stations. I love Evernote. I think Evernote is one of the greatest things ever. Um, let's see. Web comics, podcasting tutorials, mobile device help. I think of all of them, comics may be the most intriguing for mobile. Quick graphical references to explain things fast with ease. Um, I'm not touching that one. Nikki, what do you think about the comics? Um, I'm trying to read this one. I don't know much about that at all. I will be honest. But um, I do I do think that we should always, uh, let me put word is evil, I'm sorry this next one. I do think if there's any way, if, if, if doing something graphically you can encapsulate it better than using words, I think that is always a great way to go. Of course, you know, someone mentioned accessibility earlier it becomes an issue there. Same thing with videos. Videos are very, very popular thing to do, and a lot of people, that's their learning style. They like us to provide videos, but that cuts out some, some folks. Yeah, a couple of people asking about comics. I mean, we were talking about comic books or graphic novels, and actually tech com based or written in that. Um, all right, so let's take a look here. I'm going to close this poll, and then we've got about two minutes <laughs> to deal with some of these others that came in. Um, you guys are divided on this one. Uh, it looks as though the schism wins to a certain extent. The accountability thing is not too far behind, and you know, cloud-based got 20 percent. So there's a decent, there's a you know, a decent percentage here for all of these. But it looks as though the the schism question is one that people see as probably the most important of the ones that I threw out there. So let's take a look at some of the other stuff that's coming in here. Um, did a XML and structured authoring, is that a trend? Um, Nikki, you want to take that one? Sorry, did a, and I, sorry, these are just kind of hard to read. Uh, they're, uh, or this, yeah, this person I'm, is saying, is did a XML and structured authoring, is that a trend? Um, it is a, I would say it is not necessarily a trend, but those, it, those are all good things to do if they're appropriate for your project. I think, yeah. you know, they, they've all obviously proven their value in different situations. So uh, that, that's, that's what I would say about that. Okay. Structured <laughs> authoring is, it's structured authoring is very, useful if you have a very, very large, I mean, it's useful for a lot of reasons, but one being if you have a very large team and you want to enforce rules, um, you know, it's perfect for that. I mean, there's, it just depends on the situation. So what about, somebody else asked about video. What about video as a, as a trend? Yes, I yeah, I think I, I jumped I jumped on that a little earlier. It's like a lot of uh, for for some products, video is a nice solution and it suits some people's learning styles. I, I get really mixed vibes from people on videos a lot. You know, it really is a learning style thing. Some people would never watch a thirty second video; they'd rather read the words. And some people were just like, show me show me the video. So uh, as I said, you know, accessibility issues with them. But I think for some projects, they're, they're ideal. Yeah, I, you know, I am not a friend, a friend. I'm not a fan of video for me, for my personal information consumption habits. Me I'm too. also not very good at making it. Um, but that's my personal bias. I know that there are a lot of people that, you know, that prefer it. 
and I, I struggle with that because I don't really want to have to do it. Um, okay, what else do we have here? Um, I'm seeing, oh, this, this one's right up your alley, Nikki. I'm seeing a move toward more inline and in-app help instead of docs. Really good UI equals less need for formal docs. Would you agree with that? I think, um, you know, once again, if it suits your product, in, um, I, I, wor I work on doc to help and we have an embedded help pane and uh, it, it up, it's dynamic, it updates as you, as you click through the user interface. And I think that is a good solution. Now that help file is actually the, the, the file that where you're seeing specific topics as you click through the user interface is actually the same file that is this, the standalone you know, chum file. So it serves, it serves two purposes, which uh, saves a lot of time. So I guess my point in saying that is to say that you can do embedded help in a way that is, is does not have a lot of um, that it's it's not what's the word I'm looking for that it's it doesn't take too much of your time, which is the important thing. If you want to, if you you know, you still need traditional help with embedded help in the user interface. So the ideal thing to do is streamline it. Okay. Um, let's see some other things. Somebody says community is our biggest trend, um, and I think that's that's probably, you know, something. In fact, I had something in here about community, but I decided it wasn't one of the top three. <laughs> it was maybe number four. Um, lots and lots of comments about video, and I'm, I'm typing some of those back to you so that you can see it. Um, and what else do we have here? Uh, transition from paper to electronic, incorporating video in 3D. I think that's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I've seen that I, software to do that for like engineering videos, and you could move the move the machinery mm -hmm. around and see it in three D. Okay. Um, so yeah, community. A couple other ones: mobile and social. Not just shiny, but our customers are more and more mobile <laughs> and social. Um, oh, here's a vote. I, I sent out a bunch of the pro video comments because I find it hard to make such comments, but here's one that says I find videos annoying because they're always slow to load. Um, I find them annoying because I can't scan them, but that's a, that's a different issue. They do, um, yeah, they thing. do have searchability issues. People, you know, there's a findability issue with videos too. Yeah, uh, let's see, modular writing is mentioned here. Um, here's a long comment. Uh, other trends. Natural user interfaces. I'm sorry to say I don't know anything about that. Do you? Uh, Web, I am not familiar with that term. Um, we are moving away from the, I'm going to send this out, moving away from the traditional documentation and moving into more of an intuitive approach where the user's needs are at the forefront. Um, are future users going to use the TriPane or Web Help or go search for information? If I knew that, I would be very wealthy. What's your sense of that? I think that I think well, I think the cool thing about web-based help is if you can um, host it, you know, have it out there. When if you have users that do searches, they will find it, and it <laughs> and it will probably uh, float towards the top in the search. So, I th I think it's possible to have the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I think with that, I'm, I'm still seeing comments coming in about uh, search, for example. But I think with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you all for coming. We will put the webcast up there on our uh, website, and we will send out a note to everybody that was on the call, or for that matter, that was registered with the link to the recording. So we'll tie all of that together. Um, keep an eye on our events page for upcoming events. Uh, Nikki and I's next show will be at, I think, uh, <laughs> STC in Sacramento. We will, but which reminds uh, me, if you haven't renewed your STC membership yet, please do that. <laughs> Sorry, uh, short plug. Okay, blogging, some more stuff still coming in. Blogging or social media. Uh, whatever we do has to be in the context that we are scanners. We write the way we like to receive. Um, a trendy presentation. <laughs> 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 
Oh my, that's, that's kind of disturbing. Okay, so a couple of slides there. There's our contact information. Um, mine is underlined and Nikki's isn't because uh, I got nothing. Just because. <laughs> I'd, I'd blame it on PowerPoint, but sadly this was actually Apple Keynote, so I can't blame it on Microsoft, which is very sad. So um, thank you all for coming. I will try and send out some wrap-ups. We've got a tremendous number of questions, which I really appreciate because it helps us um, keep things moving along and keep things, you know, interesting instead of just talking into the void, which I'm personally not that big a fan of. So, Nikki, did you have any final words? No, that was my final word, and, and thank you very much for inviting me, and, and it was fun. It was fun. Thanks for coming. Okay, bye, everybody.